All right, welcome to Calculus 2, The Revenge. This series of lectures is meant to supplement, but not replace, chapters 4, 5, and 6 in Full Frontal Calculus, which is available at all fine bookstores near you, provided that bookstore is Amazon.com. And we are going to jump straight in and talk about the primary objects in this course. Integrals. Not a day will pass in this class when we do not talk about integrals. And on this first day, the goal is just to introduce them and to impart a solid intuition for what these things are all about. So, I want to begin by talking a little bit about area, the general problem of finding the area of some geometric figure. The problem of finding area provides the geometric motivation for integrals, just as the problem of finding tangent lines provided the geometric motivation for derivatives in Calculus 1. And just as in Calculus 1, where you learn that derivatives are useful for much more than the problem of finding tangents, so it will be the case that integrals are useful for much more than finding areas. But it becomes the kind of geometric touchstone that we can always go back to. But anyway, let's put calculus aside for a second and just go back to pre-calculus. In principle, it's easy to find the area of any old polygon. And by a polygon, I just mean a figure made up of straight sides. And you might say, well, I don't know a formula for dealing with something like that. No, you don't. But you can chop this into pieces whose areas you can find. Given any polygon, we can always connect vertices like this to triangulate the polygon. That is, turn the original polygon into a bunch of individual triangles, seven of them in this case. And of course, we do know how to find the area of a triangle. Everybody knows that. The area of a triangle is half its base times its height. And very quickly, why is that true? You should know that. It makes perfect geometric sense. And this half gives the game away. Well, it's because this triangle is half of a parallelogram. So the area of the triangle is half of the parallelogram's area. But is that useful? I mean, what's the area of a parallelogram? Well, that's easy to figure out, because given any parallelogram, we can always drop a perpendicular like this, which chops off this little right triangle, which we can then move to the other side, like that. So this stuff is gone. Now, when we moved that triangle over, we did not create or destroy any area. The total amount of area was preserved. So the area of the parallelogram is the area of the rectangle we just created. And everybody knows the area of a rectangle is its base times its height. Well, what's the base of this rectangle? Well, it's this stuff plus this little bit right here that's on that triangle that we moved. Oh, but that little bit was over here originally. So the base of the rectangle is this stuff plus this stuff. In other words, the base of the rectangle is the base of the triangle. And the height of the rectangle, well, that's obviously the height of the original triangle. So that means the area of that rectangle is half the base, the base of the triangle, times the height, the height of the triangle. And there is our famous formula. So figures with straight sides are easy. But as soon as we start talking about figures with curves for boundaries, well, now we're in trouble. I mean, there is one whose area you know, your old friend the circle. Everyone knows the area there is pi times the square of the radius. I hope you know why that is true too, but I've already had one digression here, so I'm not going to go on to another one. I will point out that in the very first video for the Calculus 1 lectures, I do actually go into that. So you can review that if you don't remember, or if you took the course from someone else, or whatever the case may be. But we do know that. Everybody knows the area of a circle is pi r squared. And that's about it for figures with curved boundaries. Some of you might know how to find the area of an ellipse, which is pretty easy because it's a stretched circle. And then there are a few very special figures whose areas you can figure out, although it often requires some fairly tortured geometric arguments. But the moral of the story is if polygons are easy, figures with curved boundaries are hard. Hard, at least in the sense that finding the area of a curved figure requires calculus. But that's what you're here for. And you might say, hey, but what about the circle? Yeah, the circle requires calculus too. Calculus in the sense that you have to chop something up into infinitely many pieces with some infinitesimal dimension in them. Go back to your favorite argument for why the area of a circle is pi r squared, and you will see this. Well, we are going to start this problem of areas with a relatively simple case. Let's start with the graph of some function f. And at least in the beginning, I'm going to assume that the values of f are positive, so everything is above the x-axis. 
Now take a couple of points in the domain, A and B, and draw lines up to the graph of the curve. This cuts off a little region here, and it is this region whose area we are going to describe. This is a simple beginning because our figure has three straight sides. It's only on one side that I get this curvy boundary. Now we wish this was like a polygon, and we could just chop it into a few pieces whose areas we know how to compute, but unfortunately the curve ruins that plan. But only if we stick to a finite number of pieces. Pieces. If we're willing to chop this thing up into infinitely many pieces, then it will be no problem. The idea is that we're going to take this interval from A to B and imagine chopping it up into infinitely many, infinitesimally small pieces. Essentially a small piece for every one of the infinitely many real numbers in that interval from A to B. And on that little infinitesimal piece, on each little infinitesimal piece, we are going to erect a rectangle that goes up to the curve. Now in my picture I've drawn that with some thickness, but of course we have to imagine it being infinitesimally thin, and that I have a little rectangle like that everywhere. Infinitely many infinitesimally thin rectangles filling up that region. That is the picture to imagine in your head. It's hopeless, obviously, to draw them all. It's hopeless even to draw one of them, but I can at least draw a schematic figure for one of them, and that's what I want to do. So here at some typical value x in the interval, I've propped up one of these infinitesimally thin rectangles. Now let's imagine blowing that rectangle up in our infinitesimal microscope so that we can see it. So we have an infinitesimally thin rectangle propped up at x. What can we say about the area of this one little piece, one of infinitely many rectangles like it? What's its width? Is it x? No, that's just where it's standing. x, after all, is that length from 0 to there. What's the actual length of that thing? That width is just an infinitesimal bit along the x-axis. So naturally, based on what you learned in Calculus 1, we'll call it dx, like an infinitesimal change in x as we move from any point on the x-axis down the road, dx. And what about the height of the rectangle? Well, it's sitting here on the value x. So of course, the height is going to be f of x. So I'll write that in here, f of x. Okay, so now we have this guy, our typical infinitesimal rectangle, and a typical infinitesimal rectangle has an area of what? Well, it's a rectangle. It's the height times the base. So it's f of x times dx. A typical infinitesimal rectangle in this setting has area f of x dx. Note that this is a real number, f of x, times an infinitesimal, dx. So the whole thing is an infinitesimal, because this is an infinitesimal bit of something real. And note also that the value of f of x, of course, depends on where we put the rectangle. It's going to be higher here than it is here, but lower here than it is, say, here. Anyway, once we have taken a figure and broken it up into infinitely many infinitesimally thin rectangles like this, and we have a representation for the area of a typical rectangle. We have a very special notation due to Leibniz for the sum of all of these guys. Because if this is the area of a typical one, well, the area of the whole region that we're trying to find, the whole curved region, is the sum of all of these f of x dx's. And the way we write that is we take the typical infinitesimal piece, f of x dx, and in front of that thing, we put this nice elegant symbol called an integral symbol, and you will notice that it looks kind of like a stretched out s, which is not an accident. The s is for sum, or for Leibniz, it was for the Latin summa, but sum will do just as well. This thing is to remind you that this is a sum of all of these things. It is an infinite sum. It's summing up all infinitely many of these infinitesimals like that. And then there's one last thing we put in this notation. We write a and b. These are the so-called boundaries of integration. They tell us when to start our sum. We sum up all the f of x dx's starting when x is a, right there, so we get a rectangle there, and then we keep summing, 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 adding all of those guys up, and we stop at b. That's what this top boundary of integration tells us. It tells us where to stop adding. a tells us start adding here, b tells us stop adding there, and pick up all of them, all infinitely many of them, effectively one for every real number in that interval. So this expression right here, which we would call the integral of f from a to b, gives us the area of the whole region in question. Soon, soon but not yet, we will learn how to actually compute such a thing.
but today is just introducing the notation and developing an intuition for what it means. When you look at this thing, you should be able to think of this in terms of area. Now do not do what I have seen some students do, which is they just have memorized the fact that this is the area under the curve between A and B, but with no conception in their heads of why that is so. Very important that you be able to pull this apart piece by piece. It's an infinite sum of infinitesimals of a particular form. You are summing up things of the form f of x dx. What are those? In this case, those are the areas of these little infinitesimal pieces. And you are adding those rectangles, those infinitesimal rectangles up from A to B. If you have that picture in your head, if you understand that intuition, if you understand what all these pieces represent, then you are halfway there. Or let's say you're a third of the way there. Yeah, it probably is a third of the battle in learning integral calculus, just having a good intuitive feel for the notation. And if you can develop that in the very first lecture, you're doing well. Another third of learning the subject is learning the computational details. And the final third is really just having a good command of the prerequisite material, pre-calculus and differential calculus. And you'll see soon how differential calculus comes into the picture, but not in this first lecture. Differential calculus, surprisingly, is going to turn out to help us actually compute a numerical value for an integral. But even in this first example of coming up with an integral like this, you can see the entire spirit of integral calculus, which is that you have something that is difficult to compute because something is wiggly, because something is changing. It's not made up of nice straight lines like a polygon. And the way you cope with that is a process of disintegration, chopping something up into infinitely many pieces so that the individual pieces are comprehensible, like in this case, rectangles, and then reintegration, bringing all the pieces together, summing them up after you've analyzed the simple infinitesimal pieces, add them all up again, integrate them to recover the whole. That's the spirit of integral calculus. Let's do a few more examples of expressing areas as integrals. Okay, here's our first example. We've got this function g, and I want an expression for the area under that curve and above the x-axis and to the right of the y-axis. What's it going to be? Well, let's figure it out. But first, do not just write down the integral in one shot. Even if you can get it right, it is very, very important as you're learning integral calculus to think your way through each integral. Think of what each piece of it represents. Build it up bit by bit. First disintegrate, then integrate. Add everything up. So let's think through the idea quickly. We're going to take this area, we're going to chop it into infinitely many pieces, namely infinitely many infinitesimally thin rectangles. So draw a typical example of a rectangle in there like this. We do this at, you know, a typical point x. What can we say about the area of that? Well, the base of that thing, the base of the infinitesimal rectangle is dx, an infinitesimal bit of x. The height of that rectangle, well, if we're doing this at x, of course the height is going to be g of x. So what's the area of that typical infinitesimal piece? Well, it's a rectangle. So its area is its height, g of x, times its base, dx. But I don't want the area just of that one. This is just a piece of a larger puzzle. That is the area of a typical slice. But I want the sum of every slice. I want to sum these guys up with an integral. Add up all the gx dx's as x runs from here, where x is 0, all the way to here, where x is 17. So I start here at zero, get that area, move to the next one, area, 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 get them all, add them all up. And the sum of all those guys is this integral, which of course is going to be the area of the whole region. Piece of cake, isn't it? So let's look at another example and let's make things more interesting. Let's say z is a function of w, so I'll put those on the axes. And so I'll call this guy h. So we'll say z is h of w. And we're going to do this between two numbers, 2 and 5. And I want an expression for the area of that thing, of that region. How am I going to do it? Again, don't be a dope. Don't write it all down at once. Think your way through. It's not as if computing areas is the be-all, end-all of integral calculus. What we're doing today is just developing habits for thinking about breaking things up into pieces and then adding up the pieces. So think about the individual pieces. I'm going to chop this region up into infinitely many, infinitesimally thin rectangles. So here's my rectangle at any old value w. 
Let's make this concrete. The area of a typical rectangle is going to be what? Well, if I'm doing this at W, the height, of course, is going to be H of W. And what about the width? Again, it's not W itself. W is that length. That's a real number. The width of this thing is going to be DW, an infinitesimal bit of the W axis. So the area of a typical infinitesimal rectangle is going to be H of W DW. It's just the ordinary height times width of a rectangle but I don't want just one of them. I want all of them. The area of the whole region, to get that, I'm going to take the thing I started with, the area of a rectangle, integrate. Because what I'm doing now is taking that typical one and adding all of them up for every value of w, starting at 2 and ending when I get to 5. So I need to put those in there, my boundaries of integration. And that is it. Let's do another one where I spell out the particular function. Let's say this is y equals x to the fourth. And one point on that graph is going to be 1, 1. So let's find an integral representation of this area under the curve. Well, once again, what are we going to do? We're going to disintegrate, then reintegrate. We're going to chop the region up into infinitely many pieces and then sum them up with an integral. So at some typical point x, where this can be anything from 0 to 1, we're going to think about an infinitesimal rectangle. So what's the area of a typical infinitesimal rectangle propped up at x? Well, what's its height? Well, if we're here at x, the function is y equals x to the fourth. So its height is going to be x to the fourth. And what about its thickness? What about its width? Well, that once again is just going to be dx, a little bit of x, an infinitesimal bit of x. So what's the area of that typical infinitesimal rectangle at x? Well, of course, it's a rectangle. So it's height times width, and therefore x to the fourth dx. So to get the area of the whole region, what do we do? Well, we add up the areas of all the infinitely many infinitesimally thin rectangles. We know those areas have the form x to the 4 dx. We're going to add all of them up as x runs from 0 to 1. So these give us our marching orders. Start at 0, add, add, chop, add, chop, add, chop, add, all the way up. Oh, when we get to 1, we stop. And that's it. That's our expression for the area of that region. Soon, 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 we will learn how to actually compute this thing, get a numerical value out of it. This one, for example, will turn out to be exactly one-fifth. Why is that? Well, stay tuned and you'll find out. But I'm going to do one last of these at the risk of boring you. But this actually leads to something interesting. Suppose we look at one arch of the sine wave, y equals sine of x. Well, you know... I hope that this point right here is going to occur where x is pi. And it's an interesting question to ask, well, what is the area under one arch of the sine wave? You might guess that it probably has something to do with pi, since there's a pi here, and trig functions are built on circles, and everywhere there are circles, there is pi, and so on and so forth. And we will answer this interesting question soon, though not today. But for now, we just want to come up with an integral representation of that area. How can we express it as an integral? Well, you guessed it. We're going to chop it up into infinitely many infinitesimally thin pieces. My dog is very excited about it, if you can hear him in the background. Well, let him have his fun. Uh, here is a piece right there. And what can we say about its area? The area of a typical infinitesimal rectangle at x. He's having a great time. Well, if we're doing this at x, the height is going to be sine x. The thickness, the width, is going to be dx. And that is our typical infinitesimal rectangle. Don't you wish you had a Basset Hound? So now that we have an expression for a typical rectangle's area, we can write down the area of the whole region. To get that, we take sine x dx, the area of one rectangle, at x, and we add all of them up as x runs from 0 to pi. And that is that. Again, before too long, once we've learned something called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, we will be able to come up with a numerical value for this. And this one is actually kind of surprising, but that will come in a later lecture. I guess there's a few things you could say about this integral for now. For example, whatever it is, we know it represents the area under this curve, and we could definitely get a lower bound and an upper bound for that. We know that the highest the sine wave goes is 1, so the area of the region under the curve is clearly less than the area of this rectangle. The area of that rectangle is, well, let's see, that's a pi by 1 rectangle. So whatever this integral is, it's definitely less than pi. And can we say anything else about it? Well, yeah. Actually, if we chop that 
box in half, that rectangle, and then we chop each half in half like that. Each one of these four triangles has the same area, so each one would be pi over 4. So that means just these two would be pi over 2, and it's clear that the area under the curve is a little bigger than that because it's got this stuff here that sticks out. So I know that if I come back over to my integral, whatever it is, it's definitely bigger than pi over 2. So it's something between pi over 2 and pi. The exact value we will produce in a later video. Or if I forget to do it in a video, it's definitely in the book but I'll try to remember. Anyway, I think you have certainly got the idea by now. But as I said at the beginning, although areas motivate the idea of an integral, integrals are about much more than areas. So I want to put the areas away for a little bit and give you another example of how an integral can arise. But instead of a geometric example, I want to give you a physical example. And even though this will feel very different on the surface, you should notice that underneath it's the same kind of idea where we're taking something that's complex globally, but we're going to chop it into infinitely many pieces, infinitesimal pieces, analyze those pieces locally where it will be simple, and then reintegrate everything, add everything back up together at the end. So let's start with a very basic physical formula. When speed is constant, if something is moving at a constant speed, the distance traveled is speed times time. Now, even if you have never studied physics, you know that this is true. If you are driving at a constant speed of 60 miles per hour, and you do so for two hours, how far have you driven? Well, of course, you've driven 120 miles. And how did you get that? You took your constant speed, 60 miles per hour, and multiplied by the two hours. So let's keep this basic principle in the back of our mind. And do not forget, there is a condition here. This is when the speed is constant. If I tell you that I've been driving for two hours and you say, well, what's your speed? And I say, well, I don't know. It's all over the place. Sometimes I'm going fast. Sometimes I'm going slow. You're not going to be able to tell how much distance I've covered. But if the speed is constant, then sure, distance is just speed times time. Of course, in reality, speed is very rarely constant. Whatever the object is, unless it's out in interstellar space, there are typically lots of forces acting on it, so its speed is changing. And if we go back to driving a car for two hours, your speed typically varies a lot, even if you're just on a long stretch of highway. In an hour, your speed varies a lot. In a minute, your speed can vary quite a bit. Though less, that person might need to suddenly really slow down because of traffic or speed up as the traffic lets up, there's probably not as much variation in it. Well, if you shrink that time interval even more and say, well, let's just follow somebody driving, not for an hour or a minute, but for a second. Well, there's not a lot of room in a second to change your speed. There is some, but for the most part, if you follow a car and clock its speed at one moment and then clock it again one second later, it's going to be pretty close to the same, unless maybe they're really smashing the brakes on or the accelerator. And if even a second is too long, look at a hundredth of a second or a millisecond. In a millisecond, there's really basically no time at all for speed to change, except under the most extreme conditions. It's fair to say that if you clock a car's speed at one moment and then clock it again a millisecond later, you're going to find that the car is moving at the same speed at the beginning and end of that millisecond. But again, even a millisecond is huge compared to an instant. We were thinking about an infinitesimal bit of time because we're doing calculus. In an infinitesimal bit of time, an instant smaller than any possible positive real number, but yet still somehow not zero. That little instant, we will say that there is no time for the speed of the car or baseball or whatever it is to vary in an instant. Now, why would I want to think that way? I want to think that way because if I have something that's moving at some variable speed, if I can think of that time in which it's moving as a sequence of instants, and I can think, well, in each instant, it's moving the same speed. And so I can find the distance it travels in each instant. I can say, well, it moves for some little infinitesimal bit of time, dt. And it's moving at whatever speed then. And that'll give me the distance it covers in one instant. And then guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to add all of those things up. I'm going to integrate them. So let's suppose that an object speed at time t is given by some formula s of t, and that s of t is not constant. It varies from moment to moment. And the question we ask is, how far does the object travel between some time a and some time b? Well, let's think it through. During a typical infinitesimal period of time, dt, occurring at time t, so not a minute, not a second, not a millisecond, an infinitesimal bit, we can think of the object speed as constant. There's not enough time for the speed to vary. 
So since its speed then is s of t, at whatever moment in time we're looking at, the distance traveled during that instant, when the speed is constant, is given by this formula right here. So the distance traveled during that instant is going to be the constant, briefly, speed times the time interval. In other words, s of t dt. Now this is a real number, s of t times an infinitesimal dt, so this is an infinitesimal. Well, of course, it's only going to travel an infinitesimal distance in an instant, but we're not interested just in what it does in that one instant. So during the entire interval, from time equals a to time equals b, the distance traveled is the sum of all the s of t dt's. That is, to get the total distance, we start with the typical distance and add them all up. We integrate as t, the time, runs from a to b, from when we start the clock to when we stop the clock. And that is it. Good. Do you see how this is the same spirit that animated our discussion of area? We're taking something unruly, a speed function that is not constant, chopping it up into infinitesimal bits, not geometric bits, but just little slices of time. Because on an infinitesimal slice of time, the speed is constant, and everything is easy to analyze in that situation. So we do analyze it in that situation, and we come up with an expression for the distance traveled in an instant when the speed is constant. And then we just add all of those guys up for every time in the interval, all the real values between time equals a and time equals b. Same idea, new context, but really the same idea. Take something complex, disintegrate it into simple pieces, analyze the pieces, reintegrate to recapture the whole. That is the spirit of integral calculus. And so much of it is captured in the notation itself. Again, one piece of Leibniz's genius was in coming up with such good notation that does so much thinking for you. Okay, we've just seen that if we have a speed function, then integrating it over some time interval, where time runs, say, from A to B, gives us the distance traveled in that time interval. But here's something interesting. I mentioned earlier that although area motivates the idea of an integral, integrals are used for all sorts of things that are not area, this being a prime example. Nonetheless, we can use area as a kind of touchstone. We can always relate any integral, even if it is not specifically about area, back to area. So for example, in this case, we have some speed function, s of t, which of course has some graph that indicates at any given moment in time what is the speed of the object at that time. And even though we weren't thinking about this graph when we came up with this integral representation of the distance traveled, we can bring it into the picture too. Because after all, if I forget about the fact that this is a speed function, and just think of it as any old function, s of t, then I could say, oh, I know what this integral right here is doing, s of t times dt. That means if I start at any particular value t, I get a rectangle whose height is s of t and whose width is dt, and therefore this s of t dt, that's the area of that rectangle. And I'm integrating them, I'm adding them all up as t runs from a to b, so from here to here. Ah, I see what this integral is doing is giving me the area under this curve. And that is perfectly true. This integral is equal to the area under that curve. But hey, that tells us something pretty interesting. Both of these things are equal to this integral. That means they are both equal to one another. That means that the area under the curve is actually the distance traveled by the object. That's something that tends to throw people off at first. The idea that you can have an area that represents a distance. But that's exactly what we have right here. So the idea of integration can connect things that normally would seem unconnected in our minds. Let's consider another physical example of how an integral can arise. Let's say we have some kind of a cylindrical vessel with a base radius of, how about, two units. Whether those are inches, nanometers, light years, it doesn't matter. And let's say that in our vessel we have some water up to a certain point. In fact, let's say we have water up to a depth of five units. And now let's say we have some other substance that's mixed in with the water. Maybe it's some kind of silt, maybe it's um, gold, maybe it's arsenic, maybe it's fairy dust, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But let's say that the density of the subject, the mass density of the subject, 
is greater down near the bottom and smaller up near the surface. And let's imagine, as I've tried to draw it here, that the density really only varies with the depth of the water. Greater density when we go further down, lesser density up near the top. But at any given horizontal slice, it's going to be about the same density throughout. So let's write this up. Let's say that the mass density of the substance, which I am going to call delta, that's pretty common for density, is a function of its height in the cylinder. So in other words, we expect the density to be the same for all points in this little region, the density to be, to be the same for all points in this little region, but different from those up here, and so on and so forth. And let's get some more symbols in here. Let's label this a kind of height axis. So this would be zero at the bottom up to five. And we're calling height h. So when we say the density is a function of its height, we could call that function delta of h. Now, if the density were constant throughout and we wanted to know how much substance is actually in that, well, all we would have to do is multiply the constant density times the volume of water. Ah, but it's not so easy because we're assuming the density is not constant. But if we put on our integral calculus goggles and use a little imagination, we can make this work. Because the idea, as I've said before, is that if we take any infinitesimally thin slice through this cylinder of water, so the thickness there would just be dh, a little bit of change in the h direction, then we might observe that within each infinitesimally thin horizontal slice of water like this, the density of the substance is constant because the density only varies with height, with depth. If they're all at the same height, all the little particles in here, well, the density of the substance in the water is the same throughout. Thus, within a typical slice at height h, like this, the mass of the substance just in that slice will be easy to compute. Since the mass density is constant there, the mass is just whatever that density is times the volume of that slice. So the mass of the substance in that slice will be delta of h, the constant density within that slice, times the volume of the slice. And the volume of the slice is easy to compute because each slice is a cylinder, and we know how to compute the volume of a cylinder. That's easy. It's just the area of the base times the height. So the area of the slice's base times the slice's height. Now what's the area of the base here? Well, the base is a circle, and we've said already that those circles will have radius 2. And the area of a circle with radius 2, well, that's pi times the square of its radius, so that's going to be 4 pi. As for the slice's height, well, we can see that right there. That is going to be dh. We need to be very careful here to distinguish our d from our delta. And maybe I'll clean that up a little further and write it as 4 pi delta of h, put in brackets, dh. Okay, so what does that represent? Well, I know because I've written it down, which I encourage you to do as well. That stuff is the mass of substance in one slice. We can now find the mass of the substance in the entire cylinder by doing an integral. Hence, the total mass of the substance is, well, you know how it works now. This stuff is the mass of one slice, but that's not all we want. We want to add up the masses of all the slices. Chop, 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 add, 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 all the way up, starting when h is 0 and stopping when h is 5. So our boundaries of integration are going to be 0 to 5. We chop and add as h runs from 0 to 5. In any integral, we're going to end with d something, and that something tells us what those boundaries refer to. Done. Once again, same old story. We have something that is variable globally, but when we chop it up into infinitely many infinitesimal pieces, we get something that is constant on each piece. We analyze the pieces, that's what we did here, where it's easy, and then we add everything back up with the integral. And soon, after you learn the fundamental theorem of calculus, you'll understand how we can actually turn this into a numerical value. Of course, we would need a specific density function in that case, but the fundamental theorem of calculus is what allows us to actually evaluate integrals, come up with numerical values for them. By the way, this notion of integrating some kind of a density function to get something is very common throughout not just physics, but mathematics itself. If you ever study probability, you will learn that there is such a thing as a probability density function. And the idea is that 
you can use it to compute probabilities. You think of probability itself almost as a substance with a total mass of one, representing 100%. And you have some kind of distribution. You've surely seen the normal distribution, the bell curve, and you end up doing some kind of an integral to come up with, say, some area under part of the curve, which would correspond to the probability of being between one value and some other value. That's a little too much to explain in a first lecture like this, but you may have seen pictures like the one I just drew, even in a basic statistics class, and already encountered the idea of probability corresponding to area. Sort of like before where we were talking about how we could think of distance in certain circumstances in terms of area, because they're all hooked up together through this notion of an integral. Let's jump back to geometry and do another example there. If I start with a graph of some function and imagine revolving that graph around an axis, like here I'll revolve it around the x-axis, you end up tracing out some surface in space. Like in this case, revolving this one around it would end up with something like this. Well, now imagine for a second that uh, this is actually a solid, a solid object in three-dimensional space. So, like, don't think of this having a hole through it. Just think of this as like a you know, big block of wood. Such a thing is called a solid of revolution because we obtained it by revolving a curve around an axis. And one question you could ask is, given some solid of revolution, what's the volume of that thing? And you might say, I don't know, this is some crazy shape. I don't know the volume of anything except a rectangular box or uh, a sphere. You do know the volume of a sphere, don't you? You should. Very famous. Four-thirds pi r cubed. If for some reason you do not know that, well, you know it now. So make sure you get that firmly in your head. But anyway, you have good reason, certainly before this, or certainly at least did before this lecture, of thinking, there's no way I can come up with the volume of that. But in fact, we can come up with a simple integral representation of such a thing. I'm not going to bother with the general picture right here. Let's be very specific. In fact, let's go back to that thing I said you should have firmly in your head. If we have a sphere of radius r, then its volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Why is that so? I am not going to prove that result here because we don't quite have enough firepower for it yet, but what we can do is come up with an integral representation for the volume of a sphere so that once we have learned more about how to actually do integrals, we'll have a starting place. We'll have something to start with. And in fact, we will be able to come up with this result without too much difficulty. By the way, this should also be easy to remember. Obviously, it's going to have an r cubed in there because it's about volume. So we're going to have something cubic. And obviously, it's r that's going to be cubed in there because r is the only thing that determines the size of the sphere. Obviously, pi is going to be in there because this is as circular a thing as you could hope for in three dimensions. The only mysterious part is the four thirds. Where does that come from? Well, as I say, we will see. But for now, let's just set up an integral to represent that volume. And we're going to use this idea of a solid of revolution because a sphere is a solid of revolution. If we start with a semicircle of radius r and revolve that guy around the x-axis, of course, we end up with a sphere of radius r. How does that help us? Well, what we can do is to chop this sphere up into little cylindrical slabs, just like we did on that density problem as well. So I can think of this sphere not as just a complete sphere, but as something where if I take a slice like this and I get a little cylindrical slab, and let's say I do my cutting here at some value of x, then the idea is if I can get an expression for the volume of that one cylindrical slab, then I can run it back and forth along the axis, add them all up as x, the place where I did my cutting, varies from here where I get little tiny slabs, let it go all the way to zero, and then all the way stop right here. So I'd be going from minus r to r. Why is that going to help us? Because we know how to find the volume of a cylindrical slab. We just did it in that density problem. It's the area of the base times the height. And you might say, ah, yeah, but I still have to come up with the area of the base and the height. True, but that's easy. The height, or rather maybe we'll say thickness of the slab right here, that's really easy. If I chop it at x, what am I doing? I'm going a little bit further, an infinitesimal bit further. So that thickness right there is clearly going to be dx. And the only challenge here is to come up with the area of the base of such a cylindrical slab. But that's really not much of a challenge either, because the base of a cylinder is a circle. And everybody knows that the area of a circle 
is pi times the square of its radius. So all I need to know is what's the radius of this circle? And you might say, oh, it's r. No, it's not r. Careful. That circle might be way down here. It's got a little tiny radius. Or it might be here where it's fairly big. The only place where the radius would be r is if I cut right there. The radius of those slabs is going to vary from 0 down here to r in the middle and then coming back down to 0 as well. So what's it going to be? How do we figure that out? Well, that's easy. We can just use the equation of the semicircle. After all, this semicircle is the graph of a particular function. It's the graph of y equals square root of r squared minus x squared, right? That too is something you should certainly absolutely know. If you do not know that, it's very easy to recover it. What's the equation of that circle, the, the circle we generated? Forget just the semicircle, the whole circle. You know that, I know you know that, is x squared plus y squared is r squared. Well, if you solve for y in that equation, you get y equals plus or minus this junk. The plus is the stuff on top, the minus is the stuff on bottom. Okay, anyway, that means that if I have my cylindrical slab or I cut here at uh, this value of x, then the radius right there is just the value of this function. If I pull that slab out, it would be easier to see if I did that. We'd have something like this. We already said its thickness is clearly dx, and now we can see that its radius is the square root of r squared minus x squared. Of course, it's a function of x because different values of x where we chop this sphere will give us different radii. So anyway, let's describe what we're doing here uh, a little more precisely in words. The volume of a typical infinitesimally thin cylindrical slab, this guy at x, the place where we chopped right there, is going to be, well, it's a cylinder. How do we find the volume of a cylinder? Area of base times height or thickness, if you want to call it that. So the cylinder's base area times the cylinder's thickness. What's the cylinder's base area? Well, that's the area of this circle. That's pi times the square of the radius. That's going to be pi times r squared minus x squared. The square root comes off because we're squaring it to get that circle's area. And the cylinder's thickness, we said that is going to be dx. Okay, but what is this? This is the volume of a typical infinitesimally thin cylindrical slab. That's nice, but that's not what we want. We want an expression for the volume of the whole sphere. So what are we going to do? Well, of course, we're going to take this thing, the volume of one of them, and add them all up as x runs from minus r to r. So the volume of the full sphere must be, we start with this guy, the volume of one slice. We want to add all of them up as x runs from what? From minus r, because that's where we start chopping, to r, which is where we stop chopping. So I will pop those boundaries of integration on, and we have it. This integral right here is going to be a piece of cake for us to evaluate once we have the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if you have understood this argument we've done, and you understand the fundamental theorem of calculus when we meet it very soon, you will know why the volume of the sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And what we just did here with the sphere, you could actually do with any solid of revolution to get the volume. Because the fact that we revolve this thing around an axis, that means that we will always be able to chop it into these cylindrical slab slices. That's not the case with any old solid. If I just have some blob out there, whatever this thing might be, there's no reason why this thing is going to be a solid of revolution. We might be able to get its volume using other means, almost certainly involving an integral, but not this very simple way that we've just described here. But please, 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 is that enough pleases? Please, one more. Be sure you understand how to think your way through such problems. Every integral that ever arises in practice is something that comes out through such means. You are always taking something, chopping it into pieces, thinking about the pieces, and putting them together to come up with an integral. The problem of actually evaluating integrals is an interesting one, and we will spend a lot of time on it. But in a sense, that's the trivial part of calculus. That's just calculation. It's thinking your way through these things, seeing where these integrals come from. That's the key. That's what you can do and your computer cannot do. Anyway, I think I will stop there. So, until we meet again, fare thee well.